Today we finish up our exploration of Buddhist and Hindu art by looking at how Buddhist art, and for that matter Buddhism itself, evolved as it moved east to China, Tibet, and Japan. Buddhism spread across northern India and into Central Asia and China along the Silk Road, a caravan route that brought silks and other Chinese trade goods such as glass, lacquer, and ceramics west to the Roman Empire and later to Christian Europe. It also introduced Roman art to parts of Asia. Around the same time that Buddhism uh, was spreading into the East, it also diverged into two separate paths. Theravada Buddhism roughly translates into the lesser vehicle. Really, it involves a focus on individual spirituality. This form of Buddhism would travel south into what is today Sri Lanka and then into Southeast Asia, especially Thailand. But a new branch of Buddhism began to develop in Gandhara. Remember the Bamiyan Buddha? This new branch of Buddhism was known as Mahayana, or the greater vehicle. It was also known as Bodhisattva vehicle because Buddhists in this tradition began to venerate Bodhisattvas. This shift in emphasis reflected a new focus on communal enlightenment and on salvation. That's why it was called the greater vehicle. You've already encountered bodhisattvas or enlightened beings who choose not to enter nirvana, but instead stay on to help others achieve enlightenment. Because bodhisattvas have chosen to remain in the world, they are often seen as dressed ornately, as you can see in this image from Gandhara. You should also note the Hellenistic and Roman influence in the drapery and curly hair. Mahayana Buddhism also developed a more theistic version of Buddhism with multiple Buddhas. There was the historical Buddha, or Shakyamuni, as well as Buddhas that had entered uh, Nirvana earlier. And Nirvana itself was transform transformed from a concept of emptiness or escape from suffering to a kind of paradise. This Gandharan frieze shows a Buddhist paradise. As Buddhism moved east into China along the Silk Road, it was this more theistic and more communally focused Mahayana form of Buddhism that took hold. Buddhism, frankly, faced some tough obstacles in China, and these are obstacles that the Mahayana form of Buddhism more easily overcame. First, the Chinese had no tradition of samsara, so a religion focused on overcoming the burden of continuous reincarnation didn't really resonate with the Chinese. But probably even more important, Confucian society was focused on social relationships, not individual self-realization. It was a very hierarchical society, and to the extent it looked to past lives, it looked not to earlier incarnations, but to ancestors. This new form of Buddhism, with its emphasis on great bodhisattvas and a more hierarchical paradise, you know, proved to be more congenial to the Chinese. Buddhism also benefited in China, as it had in India, from political and social upheaval. The Han Dynasty ruled China from around 200 BCE to 200 CE. During the Han Dynasty, Confucian philosophy dominated China, and a stable hierarchical society enjoyed considerable prosperity. Confucianism, and we'll talk about this in a later unit, basically focused on uh, maintaining one's proper relationship in society, and particularly for res on respect for ancestors and for the elders. But this ordered Confucian society fell apart for three and a half centuries as China was divided into competing states. The emperors of one of these states, the Northern Wei, adopted Buddhism as their state religion. When the Tang Dynasty reu reunified much of China in around 600 CE, its emperors also adopted Buddhism and they made it the state religion. The most famous Buddhist art from this period and today's first required work is the monumental complex of cave sculpture at Longman Caves. So let's watch a video clip from the Asian Art Museum to get a feeling for early Chinese Buddhist art and for this cave art in particular. The College Board's image is on the bottom, uh, but I rather like the panorama that puts this work into a large, into a greater context. The Longman Cave Complex was built largely in the 5th century CE at Luoyang in north central China, the city where, according to either history or legend, Buddhism first arrived in China. These caves contain more than a hundred 
8,000 Buddhist stone statues, more than 60 stupas, and 2,800 inscriptions carved on steles. The central Buddha we see here is the Cosmic Buddha, or Virakana Virokan, I've seen it pronounced both ways, Buddha, the Buddha of boundless time and space, the Cosmic Buddha. On either side of this Buddha are bodhisattvas and other guardian figures. Now, the name of this particular cave makes reference to honoring ancestors, and it's thought that the emperor and his wife, later the empress, Wu Zetan, had it carved in part to honor their ancestors. So we see some signs that Chinese Buddhism was accommodating Confucius' beliefs, as it, of course, had accommodated Hindu beliefs. While there's some dispute about this, historical records suggest that the Virakana Buddha, the large one shown here, was modeled after the face of Empress Wu Zetian, the only empress in Chinese history. Wu Zetian began her imperial career as a concubine to a Tang emperor and then later married his favorite son. When the son, Emperor Gaozong, suffered a stroke, Wu at first ruled behind the scenes, but then she declared herself empress of China. The empress used Buddhism to bolster her reign. People believed that the emperor's power was given by God. Well aware of this, Wu decided to promote Buddhism as the favorite state religion. Not surprising, since Confucian beliefs did not permit female rulers. Wu Zetian also helped translate Buddhist scriptures that would help support her rule. She was a little selective, and she used her own money to build Buddhist shrines and temples, uh, including spending significantly on this one. She invited Buddhist scholars to China, and she treated the monks with great respect. In return, the Buddhist monks declared that God had bestowed power on her. Does she remind you of anyone we've already encountered in this course who used art to promote her own importance and to try to get around the problem of being a female ruler in a male-dominated society? Remember Hatshepsut? This is the last of the required Longman Cave images, and it's my favorite. Only the figure on the right shows up in the College Board image, but I wanted you to see both since they are clearly a pair. So how would you contrast these statues of guardian figures with the Varokana Buddha on the right? Well, the guardian figures are more dynamic. They're really action figures. Their faces are fierce in contrast with that serene Empress Buddha. They also have highly defined musculature. Check out the abs on the guy on the right. Well, the College Board must like these guardian figures. They also appear in the required images for the Todaiji Temple in Japan, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Some scholars think that these guardian figures, which, by the way, were a fixture in Buddhist temples all through East Asia, they thought they actually evolved from statues of Heracles. Heracles was used in Greco-Buddhist art to represent Vajrapani, who was one of the earliest bodhisattvas to appear in Mahayana Buddhism and who is thought to be represented in these guardian statues. So check out this 2nd century Gandharan statue of Vajrapani right next to Heracles. I thought that was cool. So these guardian figures are most commonly referred to by their Japanese name, Nyo. According to Buddhist tradition, they traveled with Siddhartha Gautama to protect him. Now remember that Buddhism generally has a pacifist tradition. So stories of these guardian bodhisattvas help justify the use of physical force to protect cherished values and beliefs against evil. You can see how this might appeal to emperors, both Chinese and Japanese emperors, who used Buddhism to support their rule and who needed to protect and expand their empires through warfare. Guardian warriors also, as we'll see, appealed to the samurai who gained power in Japan in the 12th century. Note that in both pairs of statues, one figure has a wide mouth and the other has a closed mouth. Again, according to tradition, they're actually mouthing the Sanskrit words that symbolize birth and death. We'll take another look at the Japanese version, but first, let's go to Tibet. So Tibet was among the last Asian lands to come into contact with Buddhism. Buddhism actually arrived from India in the 7th century CE when a Tibetan king invited two Buddhist masters to Tibet and had important Buddhist texts translated into, Tibet, into Tibetan. As with the Northern Wei and Tang dynasties in China, this Tibetan king was hoping that Buddhism would help him unify his kingdom by creating a common religion among the people. But if Buddhism came late to Tibet, 
Nowhere did it become more central to national cultural identity. Now, Tibetan Buddhism developed many unique features, and I just don't have time to talk about them, alas. But I do want to mention Tibetan Buddhism's great emphasis on the importance of the Lama. That means teacher. It's the Tibetan equivalent of the Sanskrit term guru. These teachers are often given the honorific title of Rinpoche, which means precious one. So over the centuries, lamas played increasingly important roles in Tibet, not just as religious figures, but also as political leaders. It was a theocracy, basically. At various points in Tibet's history, a lama actually led the government. Here we see the Potala Palace, which was constructed in the 17th century by the fifth Dalai Lama. It was built to represent sacred Mount Potalaka, the home of the Bodhisattva. I'm going to, I wrote this out phonetically. I have a Lokitev. Teshvara, I think I said that wrong anyway, uh, the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Each Dalai Lama is said to be an incarnation of this Bodhisattva. Potala, which is both a monastery and a fortress, was the seat of Dalai Lamas until the communist takeover in 1959. This building is not a required work, but it's an iconic work, really represents Tibet, and I think it's quite spectacular. It also reinforces the link between religious and political power in Tibet. So the Jokong Temple is the holiest site in Tibetan Buddhism, and it's the site where each new Dalai Lama is installed. In the front of the temple, there's a large plaza and an open porch. You see that here. Tibetan prostrates, uh, pilgrims prostrate themselves, that is, they fall to the ground, uh, up to, down to their chest. The most devout pilgrims, in fact, cover the last several miles on their journey to the temple, prostrating themselves continuously. Pilgrims bring offerings to the many chapels that ring the shrine, or sometimes leave scarves or Tibetan prayer flags in the, out, in the open porch. So let's watch a short excerpt from a Buddhist-made documentary about the palace and the temple. The exterior of the temple is decorated with deer and wheel motifs. These are early symbols of Buddhism. You remember the Dharma Chakra. Uh, they also represent the Buddha's first sermon in which he turned the wheel of the Dharma in a deer park near Varanasi, India. The temple, by the way, was sacked several times during Mongol incursions, but its worst treatment came at the hands of the Chinese since their occupation of Tibet in 1959, and Tibetan Buddhism has been very severely repressed by the Chinese Communist government. So there are various traditional explanations for how this temple was founded. In one version, the Chinese queen chose the place based on the principles of geomancy or feng shui. In other words, she used, she looked for the energies found in nature, uh, and that's used to place objects in the best possible way to release spiritual forces. Another legend says that the king threw his ring into the air, asked the spirits to show him where to build the temple. The ring fell into a lake from which a stupa emerged. You read still another version involving a wicked water demon uh, who needed to be trapped by a temple. You don't have to remember all these stories, but you should remember that Tibetan Buddhists believe the temple is located on an auspicious site that was chosen with divine intervention. You don't need to know everything about the plan of this temple, but as you can see from this, it's a dark and atmospheric labyrinth. Chapels dedicated to various gods and bodhisattvas. The cloister leads to the central hall, which contains Jokam Temple's star attraction, the Jowo Rinpoche, which is also our required work. So this life-size statue of the Buddha at age 12 is the holiest object in Tibet. Tibetan Buddhists believe that this image was crafted during the Buddha's life by a celestial artist who was guided by the god Indra. Tibetans seek to pray to the statue sometime before they die, since they believe that the statue's energy will transform them and will help them at the time of their death. Often when Tibetans become sick, their relatives offer gold to the statue. The gold is directly applied to the face and bodies and offering to the Buddha. A sick or sometimes a dead person's name is written in gold on red paper and then burned in front of the statue in a butter lamp. 
Uh, uniquely among Buddhist nations, Tibet was until recently ruled by a king who was not only a senior lama of monastic lineage, but was also universally acknowledged by his great subjects as the incarnation of the great Bodhisattva Compassion. I'm not going to massacre that name again. The current holder of this office is the 14th Dalai Lama pictured here, and he's lived in exile since 1959, but he is still acknowledged by Tibetans both within and outside the country as their nation's spiritual leader. We'll close our whirlwind tour of Buddhist art in Japan. Shinto was the earliest religion of Japan, and it persists in some forms to the present day. Most Shinto deities are local, they're spirits, basically, and many are associated with agricultural seasons, with planting, growing, and harvesting. They also tend to be associated with specific clans and their ancestors. In other words, they're quite local. This focus on nature would carry into Japanese Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism, but the very localized nature of religion frankly troubled rulers who were trying to unite Japan. So Buddhism arrived from China and Korea around 700 CE, at a time when the court of the Japanese emperor was increasingly adopting Chinese customs and culture. Japanese emperors also hoped to use Buddhism as a unifying force at a time when the empire was being threatened by civil war. In 720 CE, the emperor moved his capital to Nara, which is near Kyoto. During the Nara period, Buddhism became the national religion, and the Japanese aristocracy in the court of the emperor uh, increasingly adopted the cultural values of China. This was a time of great ornamentation. It was really an aristocratic culture. Unlike the Shinto deities, which were venerated nature or at modest-sized shrines like the one pictured in the previous slide, Buddha and his host of bodhisattvas required the faithful to construct large co temples and religious complexes. And this is perhaps the most famous of Japan's Buddhist temple complexes. Uh, this is the Kondor Image Hall, and it's built in the traditional pagoda structure that traveled to Japan from Buddhist China. This image hall, or condo, is one of the largest wooden buildings in the world, and it's been rebuilt several times after fire and earthquake partly destroyed it. The original building was even larger and more magnificent. Let me interrupt myself for a minute and say there was no Chinese pagoda in the images, yet it's one of the most iconic Chinese images, and they were built vertically uh, with images of the Buddha contained on different levels, somewhat like the stupa at Borobudur, believers would ascend to the heights. Maybe we'll have a chance to look at pagodas when we get to Asian art. But back to Todaji, it was built in the new capital, Nara, uh, as a symbol of Japan's emergence as an important center for Buddhist culture. The temple houses the world's largest bronze statue of the Buddha, standing almost 50 feet tall. This is another Buddha, Vairokana. Remember, that's the celestial cosmic Buddha who lives in Nirvana. He showed up in Longman Caves, remember? Priests and scholars had already brought several different schools of Mahayana Buddhism from China to Japan, but the school that found favor with the Nara court centered on worship of this universal cosmic Buddha. Not surprisingly, the top Buddha was, was worshipped by the emperor, the top honcho in China. So building this gargantuan Varakana Buddha uh, required thousands of craftsmen. It also used up all the copper in Japan, which almost bankrupted the state it was designed to protect. The copper was gilded when gold was discovered in Japan about the time the statue was being completed. By the way, I should make it with bronze as an alloy of copper, so that was a little confusing. Sorry, I should have fixed that. So the all-pervasive power uh, the Varokana Buddha gained extra significance when the emperor proclaimed that his ancestor, the great Shinto sun deity Amaterasu, had revealed to the emperor that she, that is the Shinto god, and the Buddha were one. Here again, we see Buddhism merging with, merging with older traditions and accommodating local beliefs. We saw how Hinduism and Buddhism in particular merged in Indonesia. So which mudra do you see? This Buddha's hand is raised in the Fear Not Mudra, which is especially appropriate for protecting an empire. Over the following centuries, the power of the emperor and the imperial court in Japan gradually declined, and it passed to the military clans and their armies who proceeded to fight each other. 
These were the samurai warriors of fame. Well, one of these samurai seized power in 1185. He moved the capital from Nara to Kamakura, which is just south of Tokyo. He also took the title of shogun, which literally means general, top army guy. Uh, the emperor remained, but really just as a figurehead. So under the shogunate, the earlier rule of the emperor and a few rich, cultivated court families with an aristocratic culture gave way to a more broadly based feudal regime of daimyos or barons who had much more of a warrior culture. So the ornate decoration gave way to a vigorous, virile simplicity, again, suiting warriors. So this gateway was built in 1199 during this period as part of a reconstruction of the monastery after the Civil War that brought in the shogunate and following a revival of Buddhism at Nara that the shogun promoted. He too wanted to use Buddhism as a unifying force. Note, the again, the warrior line, strong, severe, somewhat simple. So these guardian figures stood at the gate, and they were created at the same time. I talked about guardian figures earlier. Now I'll talk specifically about these statues in the Todoji Temple. The Nyo, as they are known in Japan, are traditionally named Agyo, the open mouth statue representing the beginning of the universe, and clove mouth Ungyo, representing its end. Once again, we see the warrior spirit of this new regime. So look at those fiercely glowering eyes, the tense muscles, the swirling drapery. Don't mess with this shogun, and don't mess with his guardians. So these huge sculptures were designed and created under the supervision of the leading sculptor of the shogunate, an artist named Unkei. His workshop was known as the Kei School. The statues were built around a core of ten massive timbers that were bound together. The wood, by the way, was Japanese cypress, uh, which has turned out to age remarkably well. The statues have more than 3,000 parts held together with large posts or iron clamps and nails. The outer skin was covered with a mixture of linen and lacquer. We'll talk more about lacquer later in the course, but essentially it's a, it renders the surface shiny, and then it was painted. The samurai rulers who took over in Japan were also Buddhists, but they followed a different school of Buddhism. They weren't into Vairokana, imperial-style Buddhists. Instead, they adopted a different school, Chan Buddhism in Chinese, or as it's better known in the West, Zen Buddhism. Buddhism, which is its Japanese name. So the samurai were drawn to Zen Buddhism's focus on finding inner peace and enlightenment through meditation and self-denial. Samurai followed a code called Bushido, which, fo which taught followers to embrace the possibility of death at any moment. So this principle partly came from Zen Buddhism, which emphasized the necessary impermanence of all material bodies. Zen Buddhism also taught samurai to clear their minds of all thoughts before battle, which helped them overcome fear and destruction. So it was basically an attractive religion and philosophy for warriors. So where did the Buddhist warrior or monk go to clear his mind? to that most famous form of Zen Buddhist art, the Zen Garden. So let's take one last quick video tour warning. This one's a little goofy, but it's the best I could find. The Rohanji Dry Garden is about the size of a tennis court, and it's composed solely of 15 large and small rocks encircled by moss and grouped in five clusters on a bed of carefully raked white sand. From a distance, the rocks resemble islands, the sand resembles a tranquil sea, but actually there are a lot of interpretations about what this might mean, we're not certain. You did learn from the video and from your reading that we unenlightened folks can't see more than 14 of these rocks at any given time, emphasizing we have not yet reached full enlightenment. So Zen monks led austere lives in their quest for the attainment of enlightenment, and these rock dry gardens or karasansui, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong too, a suit at this. In addition to daily meditation, Zen monks engaged in manual labor to provide for themselves and to maintain their temple properties. Many Zen temples constructed dry landscape courtyard gardens, not for strolling, but for content, contemplative viewing. They were meant as an aid to meditation, and many people still find that they aid meditation. So cleaning and maintaining these gardens was a kind of active meditation. Another popular garden style was the promenade garden, often uh, set up for the tea ceremony. And this was designed to capture, but also in many ways to improve upon nature. And we've noticed that there's a very strong emphasis on nature in the Japanese tradition, really more than in the Chinese tradition. 
Japanese Zen gardens also used borrowed scenery, the Japanese term is shake, to strengthen the feng shui uh, of the of the location. Again, those are the spiritual forces contained within the land, which can be released with the proper arrangement of objects. Uh, we're going to see this emphasis in Chinese and Japanese landscape in a later unit. Because Kyoto was bordered on the west, north, and east by low but very visible mountains, Borrowed scenery was easily incorporated into garden designs. Here is another non-required image from the Ryongji Garden. Note how it incorporates the view of a high hill on the east. Well, this plan of the garden is the third and final required image. I've added a labeled image from the internet to make it all clearer. Note that the complex includes several other temples and gardens, and we have run out of time. We're now going to move to the third great religious tradition that we'll consider in this unit the faith and the art of Islam.